Geoscientist, I'm a licensed soil scientist, plant nut. And the talk tonight is on, well, if I press the button, got to hold it there. Ah, delay. Compost tea, this is the third part of a five part series on soil improvement. Well, Probably some of you remember, I gave it, oh, about seven, eight years ago for the Rose Society. Compost tea was just starting to come into. There were huge success stories. There were huge failure, failures. There were people saying people using compost tea were quacks, the snake oil. It was all over the map. So Baxter asked me to come back and talk about what have we learned over the last seven, eight years. Well, compost tea is part of a tools. Has anybody read the book, Teaming of Microbes? Every gardener needs to read that book, period. It is a Bible of all the latest revisions in soil science. You know, when I was in grad school, it was chemistry and physics. We now know soil biology is 10, 15 times more important than chemistry and physics. So if you get the biology right, most of your problems go away. Well, anyway, from what we know of what we call the healthy soil food web, if, if we get the soil right, we get disease suppression, we get nutrient retention. You know, soil structure, water, oxygen, crop quality, flavor, yield, everything just gets better. And you do it, it's organic too, which is nice. You don't need toxic chemicals. Well, from this model, we've learned many things in soil science, like weeds, like soils, lots of bacteria. We've learned that, from, but yet our perennials, are, like some of our trees may want hundreds to thousands of times more fungus in the soil. Roses like a hundred times more fungus than bacteria. So if what we do to the soil will shift the biological populations, either backwards where it favors weeds, or we can shift it forward where it's for more desirable plants. Well, the things we do to the soil Everything from air pollution, acid rain, clear cutting, compaction, fertilizers, all these different things.
can shift this ratio one way or other. Tonight we're going to look at one of them, compost two. So if you've got questions, we've got plenty of time, it's an informal talk, please stick your hand up. So what is compost tea? Have you ever thought about it? Basically, compost tea is just getting the microbes, maybe the water-soluble humic and fulvic acids, out of the compost into the water. There's a lot of things that are kind of lumped together under the name compost tea. And particularly in horticulture, we want to talk about actively aerated compost tea. So, if we get a good compost tea, it can provide fertility, but it's not a fertilizer. It can prevent disease extremely effectively, but it's not a fungicide. It can reduce your insect problems, but it's not an insecticide. It can get rid of weed problems, but it's not a herbicide. We've learned a lot over the years. I think it echoes less when I'm over here. <laughs> uh, so how do we define compost tea? Well, the first class is the group's called NCT, non-aerated compost tea. I remember about seven years ago, there was a guy up at A&M took a cow patty out of a bucket, out of a pasture, threw it in a bucket, let it sit in water overnight, wrote a paper and said compost tea doesn't work. Well, it got a lot of publicity and a lot of things. That is not compost tea. That was manure tea. When I was a boy, my grandmother, my uncle had a dairy farm. Every time we went to see him, my job was to shovel up a bunch of cow patties into the bucket. And she'd make tea and water her plants with it to get the nutrients out of it. But that's not compost tea. The leachate that comes out of your compost pile, that is not compost tea. And just throwing compost in a bucket of water and doing nothing? That is not compost tea. Well, we also got extracted tea, which is another version or flavor. Then we've got the one that's really stirring things up. It's called actively aerated compost tea. Well, one of the things we're learning, if compost tea is made properly, it acts as a foliar fertilizer leaves through the stomata can absorb nutrients extremely quick. We can get growth hormones and many things. It acts as a biostimulant. It acts as a microbial inoculant. Ohio State has now identified over 25 types of pathogens, both foliar and soil borne, that compost tea is more effective than any chemical on the market and 90% cheaper to use. It can help speed the breakdown of bad cultures like pine bark. You get pest suppression, you get better soil biology, so you get less root rots, less water requirements, different things. So it's becoming a major tool in our toolbox. Well, like on the disease control side, some of the, the mechanisms, if you make the tea correctly, you have all kind of bacteria, fungus, protozoa, nematodes in the tea. These good guys, they compete for the same food as our pathogens, the fungus, the black spot, the mildews. So the pathogens starve to death. They cannot outcompete the good guys. Some of these microbes produce chemicals that suppress the growth of pathogens. Everybody's familiar with penicillin, right? It comes from a bacteria, suppresses certain bad bacteria. Also, a lot of the good microbes, some of the protozoa, some of the nematodes, eat the bad guys. So if you got them there, they keep the good the bad ones thing. Then the other thing is, we don't fully understand it yet, but plants that have been sprayed with a good compost tea become very disease resistant. It's an induced, like you get stronger and healthier. I guess kind of like us, we eat healthy food, organic food, take vitamins and supplements. We have a lot less health problems. So plants get healthier. And actually some of the research up at Cornell, they've taken a plant and taken the roots and divided it into two pots. In one pot they put compost tea, the other one they put pure pathogens, you know, like a fusarium or a toddler. Even though the roots are in there for the disease, somehow the roots in the good side of the compost tea and the microbes transfer resistant to the pathogen side. 
Yeah, <laughs> we don't know how, but a lot of cool, really cool stuff starting to happen. So, well, in the actively aerated compost tea, we got two major methods of creating compost tea. The first one is what we call, we got an extraction, you know, compost is full, you know, just a handful of compost can have six, seven trillion microbes in it. So we have to get these critters out of there. So that's the first one, we got to extract them, get them off the compost particles. Then once they're in a water solution, we got to grow them to high densities so they become effective. So how do we do that? Well, one of the things we know is that most of the good microbes require oxygen. All the pathogens don't like oxygen. So by increasing the oxygen, we get good guys and eliminate the bad guys. So, well to start with, you have to have a high quality compost. One of the reasons some of the early studies failed, why do we put chlorine in our drinking water? To kill the bugs, the microbes. You'd be surprised how many people with PhDs in universities across the country use chlorinated water to make their tea and they wonder why it didn't work. <laughs> you know, it's like trying to run the Boston Marathon and shooting yourself in the foot first. You've got to get rid of the, you know, the chlorine and the chlorine and the fluoride. They're all toxic to the microbes. <clears throat> so we got to, you know, so we have to have good quality compost. We've got to get rid of the bad stuff in the water. That's why a lot of people use well water, rain water, because it works better. We've got to provide foods for the bacteria and fungus. What kind of foods do bacteria like? Come on now. <laughs> they like sugars. Like green grass cuttings. What happens to green grass you put it in a plastic bag on your curb for a couple days? That's bacterial decomposition. Bacteria like sugars, molasses, things like that. What kind of foods do fungus like? They like humic acids, fulvic acids, fish emulsion. So we can, by what we put into the water, into the tea, we can shift that population, either bacteria or fungus, on the compost tea. Then lastly, we've got to have a brewer capable of getting the microbes off the compost and increasing dissolved oxygen in the water. So, so compost. <clears throat> you know, myself and dozens, hundreds of other scientists all across the country looked into why there were failures. The biggest single cause of failure in some of the early studies on compost tea, the researchers used a bad compost, low quality compost. The tea is only as good as the compost you start with. You know, you can't get a high quality product from low quality compost. To use a computer analogy, garbage in, garbage out. Use cheap, low quality compost, you get low quality tea, it doesn't work. So, the other thing we're trying to do to use a food analogy, we're trying to get the microbes in the soil up. Why do we take probiotics? Why do we eat you know, yogurt with live cultures? 80% of the human immune system is the microbes in our stomachs, in our gut. Similarly, in nature, the soil is the immune system for plants. <coughs> so by using compost tea in our landscape, either as a foliar spray or a soil drench, we're increasing the microbes, makes plants healthy and prevents disease. Well, one of the things we're learning, again, looking at all the studies that work, studies that fail, your carbon-nitrogen ratio has to be between 25 to 1 and 40 to 1. Oh, about a year and a half ago, I gave a talk here on soil biology. Anybody remember what the ideal carbon-nitrogen ratio is in the soil for healthy plants? Oh, come on now. It's between 30 to 1. 30 to 1 is what a protozoa is. 30 to 1 is what a nematode is. 30 to 1 is what an earthworm is. 30 to 1 is what a bird is. 30 to 1 is what the human body is. It's a constant all through nature. Hmm, I wonder why we've got to be in that range for compost tea to work. So the compost 
It has to be very mature. It has to be a cure. Other things we've learned, a lot of companies make compost machines called windrow turners. They make it the compost in six weeks or less. Put it on a concrete slab. Well, the high heat from compost kills off many of the beneficial protozoa. It kills off the beneficial nematodes. You know, nematologists have identified 1,400 species of nematodes. Only 20 are pests. The other 1,380 are beneficial. Well, one of the things we learned, when you put compost and cure on bare ground, the good nematodes will come out of the soil and repopulate the compost as it cools off. But if you had the compost sitting on an asphalt slab, you never get these good guys back in. So, also we learned that compost in your forest had a lot more biocontrol <coughs> agents in it. Many of the microbes in compost cannot take the high temperatures, so you shrink down your population. But after it's composted and the temperature cools off and it's curing, if you're near a forest, all kind of beneficial microbes come back in from the wind, bird droppings, and repopulate the compost giving you a bigger diversity. I remember about 15 years ago, Ohio State, Dr. Harry Whitenick up there, was working on biological disease control. You know, we've known for years that certain bacteria control certain fungus. He put two species of bacteria, nothing happened. Five species of bacteria, nothing happened. Ten different species. He started getting disease suppression. When he put in the 15th strain of the bacteria, he had 100% disease control. So somehow, the microbes work synergistically. So the bigger diversity we get, the bigger quality. So again, little things we've learned. Other things on the compost side. Yeah, I figured that one out back. So, well, the feedstocks the compost is played with. If people are using something that's low in sugar, high in cellulose, what kind of feedstock fits that criteria? Branches, Branches and limbs of trees. Lignin, cellulose. So that affects it. You get a lot of trichodermy family in microbes. If you use high sugar, low cellulose, then you may get these guys, things like grass cuttings, food waste. So depending on how the compost is made and the ingredients affects it. Other things we, we've learned, the compost has to have very low salinity. You cannot use a compost from cow manure, poultry manure, because they're very high salt compost. They do not work. So again, we've learned why some of the research failed. Other things, there's many kinds of things, humus, lignin, cellulose, they're resistant. You've got to give it enough time in the composting to break these things down and get the microbes. So the guys that go out here and make compost in two, three weeks and sell it to you, you're not going to, it's not going to make good compost tea. It's not a good compost either. <clears throat> the other thing we're learning, again up at Ohio State, uh, Dr. Clive Edwards got four or five books out now on the research over the last 30 years, earthworms what we call earthworm castings, sometimes called vermicompost. He's discovered as little as 5% vermicompost in a soil mix controls every soil disease known to mankind. Well, if you mix a little vermicompost into your thermal compost to make your tea, you've increased the spectrum of bac bacteria, fungus, a variety of species. So maybe from 15, 20,000 species of bacteria, you've jumped into 40,000 species. Thousands. So these are the things we're learning. Yes, ma'am. How long do you um, compost to get the system uh, when Oh, when you can no longer recognize it as wood chips. So it's like, I mean, it's brown it's like and crumbly. Powder or no, it's just it's kind of gummy, powder. brown and humus. Yes, ma'am. salt to get high salt. Why do we put salts in canned goods, potted meat, hams, jerky? Because it kills microbes. 
if we put it in our compost, it's going to kill our microbes, and the tea's not going to work. So we've learned a lot of different things over the years. Okay. The one thing across the board for compost tea to work, or even to have a good compost, it has to have manure in it. <clears throat> Back in the late 1970s to the 80s, early 90s, you know, we started becoming aware of the need to recycle organic waste in horticulture, agriculture. So there was a lot of research coming in, funded by the USDA and the EPA. And there were literally thousands of papers published over that 10, 15 year period. And one thing they found, for compost to be, make a good compost, it has to have animal dirt. Maybe only 5%. It's an inoculant. For example, think about harsh manure. Harshes eat a lot of branches and limbs, don't they? So they got microbes in their gut to break down the cellulose, the lignin. Cows don't eat grass. They don't break that stuff down. So you don't have the right microbes you need. So <clears throat> compost without manure doesn't work, and it's worthless. <coughs> Another thing, we found a lot of the failures where compost tea didn't work. Researchers used mushroom compost. Anybody know what mushroom compost is? Fungus. What? Fungus. Well, it has fungus in it. It's not a real compost. First of all, to make the substrate that the mushrooms are raised on, you, use, you may use manure, straw, things like you would normal composting. You partially compost it. Then you dope it with sodium chloride, so salty, nothing else can live in it except the species of mushrooms you want to grow. Once the mushrooms have used all the nutrients and it won't grow mushrooms anymore, you have what technically is known as spent mushroom substrate. Who wants to buy spent mushroom substrate? Well, gee, that didn't work, so let's call it mushroom compost and we'll find some suckers to buy it from us. <laughs> so you get the substrate that's loaded with table salt. So it fails. Yeah? Where does the average person find horse manure? We've got 300 stables here in town. So you have to go to that extent. Yeah, there's a few places to get it bagged, yeah. or you can you know, buy it from companies that use it in their production. Don't so, compost horse oranges a lot of uh, antibiotics? Very, it depends if they're pasture raised or they're staple raised. If you go to some of the, like that big equestrian center on the west side of town, there's probably got a lot of annex with the racetrack. If you go to just people that are average people that have, you know, horses boarded and stable, probably very little. Again, horses on natural grass the right, that are free to roam and graze don't get sick. It's only the ones that eat grain, genetically modified grains and foods that get sick. So. <clears throat> and then how long do you, would you compost the horse manure for before you're able to use it? Depends on what's with it. Okay. Uh, minimum of probably 120 days. Uh, you know, we go about a year. And there's other reasons why, you, if you go a long time, you can break down if there's any chemical residues, like on grass and leaves, any fungicides left over, those will biodegrade if you get it enough time. So, <clears throat> okay. And again, like I said, small amount of vermicompost, even 5% mixed into your compost tea with your thermal compost, greatly enhances its effectiveness. Excuse me. Oh, other things we've learned. The water temperature is very important. How would you feel if, you know, it's a nice sunny day, 95 degrees in Houston, you've been outside working, you've got a nice sweat, and you jumped into some ice water at 40 degrees? Would that be a pleasant experience? No, microbes are living creatures. So, one of the reasons some of the these research early things said compost tea didn't work. They had brewed maybe compost tea in an air-conditioned building, take it out to 95 degree temperatures in the middle of the afternoon and use it. It shocked the microbes. Some of them died, others went dormant. So you lost the effectiveness because they didn't like it anymore than we would. 
So, you know, it's best when you're brewing compost tea, do it in the straight tree in the backyard at whatever temperature, so it gets close to what the ambient temperature is. <clears throat> also, we got to bubble oxygen through the tea. It can never go anaerobic. When, if you put some food resources, you get your compost, you add a little seaweed, maybe some molasses, the microbes start growing. Some of these things, they can double their population every 30, 40 minutes. So over a 24-hour period, you get extremely high numbers quickly. But they each use an oxygen. So if you don't put enough oxygen into the water so they can breathe, you go anaerobic. Pathogens like anaerobic conditions. Also, when things go anaerobic, what chemical is produced? Now, I know we've got people enjoy a good cold beer and some wine in here. Alcohol, excellent. We get alcohol produced. It only takes one part per million alcohol to kill a plant root. Not very much. So even if it only goes anaerobic for a few hours during the brewing cycle, you'll have a bad tea. The other thing, because it's biologically alive and you brew these high, extremely high levels of microbes in the tea, if you don't use it pretty quick, they run out of food, they start dying off. So you're, instead of having a high population, all of a sudden it just plummets. You lose the effectiveness. So that's why it's best used fresh. Other things we found some of the researchers. What is a triple tip fertilizer? Or triple 13? It is a salt, chemically. You know, when I was a boy, I wanted to go fishing. I watched all my buddies spend hours digging worms. I just take a wash tub out, take a cup of my dad's triple 13, throw it there, my canoe paddle, stir it in, dissolve it, pour it on the ground, and the earthworms come running out of the soil because they knew they were dying. Just pick them up, rinse them off, and I was ready to go fishing. I had two or three hundred earthworms in three minutes. Salts. All artificial fertilizers are chemically salts, and they kill beneficial microbes. That's why more and more people are switching to, or to organic fertilizers. Other things we found, <clears throat> you know, there's different ways to use compost tea. You can use it as a preventative, where you can dilute it down four or five times. Or, if you've got a severe problem, you may want to keep it concentrated. Like, if you've got a brown patch problem in your yard, you may want to use it full strength so you can really hammer it and knock out the brown patch, the rhizotonia salina. <clears throat> but we found people diluting it 20, 30 to 1. Even on a, you know, something like Fundinex, if you put it 20 times less than what the label says, it's not going to work. I have been researching this, and there is so much stupid stuff done by our researchers. It's unbelievable. <clears throat> Other things we can do. Optimization. Well, what happens if you do a special compost that's got chitin in it? Why is chitin important? Probably never thought about it, have you? What is chitin? <laughs> oh, it's what crab shells, shrimp shells are made of. All pathogenic fungus have chitin in their cell structure. So if you make a compost where you have chitin in it, then you encourage the microbes that break down chitin, you'll now have a compost or a compost tea that will break down the cell wall of the pathogenic fungus and kill it. That makes sense? We're learning how to work with nature. So, Things we didn't know even five, ten years ago. So, and of course, if you get more people working, you know, people want, you know, we, had, we want to say pick up an old Volkswagen. I remember in high school, you know, think we show off the girls to pick up the Volkswagen in front end. You know, one or two of us probably couldn't do it. You get six of us, we can pick it up and move it. Same thing. And the microbes, as we get bigger diversity and more of them, it works better. And the other thing we found is a lot of researchers, they had a batch of compost tea, never clean it. 
The other one, we start getting biofilms. Bacteria have powerful enzymes. They put out glues that stick to the surface and stuff. You get biofilms. They harbor the pathogens. Pretty soon, the compost tea became a pathogen tea <coughs> because they didn't clean their equipment. How would you like to go to a doctor or surgeon who operates on 40 people and never cleans his equipment between patients? Or, 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 or Brewers. No, or, or uh, Bluebell. <laughs> the same. Right. Same thing. If you don't clean it, you'll get pathogens. That's a good example. So, little things we're learning. So, so what are the modes of action? I've told you some of the pitfalls and why. Well, some of the modes of action, you know, we got to cover the surface. On a leaf surface, there's certain spots we call binding sites that microbes will attach to. It can be a good guy there or a bad guy. If we flood it with a compost tea with billions of good guys, which one do you think is going to attach that binding site? You get a good guy. So if a pathogen comes in on the wind or somewhere else, there's nowhere for him to attach to that leaf because of the binding site. So he just dies because he can't get food or blows away. Okay, like I said, talk about the nutrients. Also, many of these microbes produce secondary metabolites, what we call antibiotics, and they kill the pathogens. Many of the good guys eat the bad guys or create things that kill them. <clears throat> Other things we've discovered is when we got high levels of microbes on the plant, the leaf, the roots, the plant's a natural immune system becomes 10 or 15 times stronger. So it's able to resist pants and disease. Then we can, in your tea, you'll know, be some nutrients from the compost, and depending on how we brew it, if we use the seaweed extract, or maybe a fish emulsion, or humates, there's lots of dissolved nutrients the plant can absorb to its leaves and stem. So if the plant gets healthier, it has more strength and more structural defense. The lignin and the cell become tougher, harder for insect to chew through. So, little things. Well, let's talk about a couple examples for problems. Anybody ever have a mold problem? Okay, I see a few heads nodding. Well, what do moles feed on? Grubs, earthworms, beetles, and larvae of the soil? Well, if you've got a mold problem, you want to get rid of it, why don't you brew a tea that's extremely high in beneficial nematodes? Because nematodes kill grub worms. They kill those, the beetle larvae. Without no food source, the molds go away. Or if you have a flea problem, a lot of people have been extremely effective to get rid of fleas in a yard. They've got cats and dogs. Again, you get beneficial nematodes and protozoa that eat the flea eggs and stop the breeding cycle. And the flea problem goes away in 30, 60 days. So, for either one of these cases, you, you brew a tea rich in nematodes and protozoa. You know, sometimes a compost will have in it, or sometimes some people just go out to the woods under a log, a rock log, and get the rotting, the humus material full of nematodes. Or you can just order some for supply houses now you can buy a little pack for ten dollars. So we got lots of options that didn't exist a few years ago. So let's look at a few examples. I've kind of given you an overview of some of the issues about compost tea. Well, here is a leaf surface that was sprayed with a good compost tea. This is actually a corn plant. It was having the field was having a rust problem. Can you see any leaf surface? It's 100% covered by beneficial fungus and bacteria. A pathogen cannot even get there to attack the leaf. So they had 100% disease control by using the tea. This was on a golf course. You know, they mowed it to a half inch out there in the rough. Who says you can't grow big roots? Yeah. I want to 
use compost tea one time. How often do you think you had to water? Never. Because when it rained, instead of having this kind of root zone to get water out of, he had that kind of root zone. So, this is from a customer of mine, Betsy Ross Petula, the uh, Betsy Ross Farms out there in Granger, Texas, outside of Austin. She used to be a conventional <coughs> rancher. Almost about 10 years ago now, she started going organic. She got tired, you know, losing money, couldn't get money for cattle, constant poor calving, lots of vet bills. Just like most ranchers, she was struggling. She went organic and started spraying her pastures with compost tea, a fungal-based compost tea. Well, several things happened. All the native grasses they hadn't seen in 40 years, the blue stem and some of the others, the buffalo fed on, started sprouting out of seed banks. They had to have the fungus in the soil. The protein of her grasses shot up from 3 4% up to 23%. All the vet bills went away. 100% calving. Instead of a pound, pound and a half of weight gain a day, her cows were getting three and a half, four pounds a day. And now, when she overseeds the clover, look at the size of that nitrogen fixing bacteria nodules. She does not have to buy any nitrogen fertilizer in the last 10 years. The plants get it out of the air for free because she got the biology right by using compost tea. How'd you like to grow grass along the ocean front? This is up in New England somewhere. On pure sand loaded with salt, by using compost tea, I think they spread it about once a month. Look at the results in a year. Stabilize the sand. Talk about a difficult environment. Uh, here's another example. You know, and we don't have to be, when we apply compost tea, it doesn't have to be perfect. Here's the, this is a grape leaf, and they had 100% of the surface front back covered with compost tea. And they covered 70% 70 70 of the leaf surface with the fungus. No disease. And then there's those green dots of the binding spots on the leaf surface, just so you can see what they kind of look like. Well, they said, well, you know, in practice, reality, you're never going to get 100% coverage. So let's find out. So we get 70% coverage. And they've covered 70% of the leaf with compost tea. Still got 100% disease control. So it is inducing a systemic problem away from the actual application. <clears throat> when the leaf was 50% compost tea and 70% fungus, and this is spraying concentrated fungal spores all over the leaf. Then it starts showing up, and it didn't, there it is there, but it didn't kill the leaf until you got almost 70% covered with fungal spores and only 10% tea before it actually controlled and killed the leaf. Powerful effects. Uh, this is courtesy of a, a landscaper down in the nasty area, Grace Outdoors, Bill Wyatt. He's an expert at compost tea, and I'll show some more slides from him in a minute stuff here at work in Houston he's doing, but he forgot to clean his bag one night, came in late, over two inches of fungal growth hyphae in less than 12 hours. It's amazing how fast these microbes can grow and reproduce under good conditions. So that also illustrates the importance of cleaning your equipment between batches because these the bad guys and things. Then a number of years ago, as we started becoming interesting of compost tea, how many people remember this article on the American Rose? American Rose Society commissioned a study to test compost tea against immunox, one of our chemical controls. They found that compost tea worked better than any chemical in the market, 90% cheaper to use, had no health consequence, but it had terrible side effects. The flowers got larger, the color is more intense and the fragrance stronger. <laughs> yeah, because you have a healthier plant. So obviously. Then over the years I've been traveling around the country, like Oregon Gardens has a huge rose garden. I think they got six, seven hundred varieties of roses in it. Right there on the Oregon Coast, cool, mist, wet climate, one hundred percent disease control using compost tea. Who's 
big rose grower here in Texas that uses compost tea for the disease control. Yep, antique rose emporium. Excellent, Baxter. They've been doing it about 10 years, very successful. <coughs> so anyway, questions before I continue on. I see heads modding, I see some people kind of shook. Yo. When you say it's very important to clean the composter, tell us that process, what does it involve? Oh, uh, there's a lot of ways. It can be whether it's a simple bucket, big brewer, get in there with some kind of like hydrogen peroxide, maybe a mild soap of water, and just scrub the surface of a sponge or something to get it off. If you have compost flowing through tubes, you've got to get a brush in there and clean it. Anything that you touched. And we'll talk about that more. And that's another reason why some of the studies failed like the, the people had air tubes going in, blowing air into the tea to aerate it, and they're ready to use it. And they turned off the blower and the tea rushed into the hose and never cleaned their, the hoses because always remove your aeration stones before you turn the blowers off. That way tea never gets in there and you don't have to clean it. So, we'll get there. There's lots of ways, and so it can get simple or complex. So, like I said, we, you got to have the degas water, no chlorine, no chloramine, no fluoride. So that's one of the first signs. How do you get that? You can buy filters to remove it from your water system. Just screw it on the end of your faucet, run your water through it. Get this one. Uh, Different ones get different things, but vitamin C filters are becoming popular. My wife used to have a dry skin problem. We put a vitamin C thing on, filter on the shower. Within a week, her dry skin problem cleared up. Because chlorine is the active ingredient in bleach. So she was, every time we took a shower, she was bleaching her skin. She wondered why she was having problems. So, so anyway, there's filters out there, rainwater. Um, for the chlorine, you can let it sit out for 48 hours overnight, and the chlorine gas will escape. If you got a five-gallon bucket, you can put three or four ounces of humate in it. And that'll get rid of the chloramine over the other 24 hours. Four rides a little more problematic, but at least you reduce the other stuff. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, I gotta say something. You, you said rainwater, put it in the thing, and, it, and the chlorine will evaporate. No, rainwater, you can use rainwater, or if you have to use city water, you gotta get rid of that stuff, or it won't work. The other thing we're learning about using compost tea, once we have a tea, Either during the brewing cycle, we can add you know, seaweeds, humates, fish emulsion, humic acid, folic acid to help increase or change the microbial content. <clears throat> or we can add, you know, apply, do it in application time. Well, like humic substances or fungal foods, carbohydrates, sugars, or bacterial food, amino acid, depending on the type, can be either way. Um, extracts, we can put these things into the tea as we apply it and it makes the tea more effective. We call these adjuvants. Or we, they'll make other aspects of the tea more effective. So, here's a simple example. They took a, like one of the things, we have opened up a nursery garden center last year at my operation. Usually in July and August, you know, the black plastic pots get so hot at a nursery garden center in Houston, plants start going downhill. They look bad, they quit growing, they quit blooming. You can't put enough water on <clears throat> Well, last year we got our compost tea brewer about the middle of July and we started making batch of compost tea. And with our irrigation, we used one of those suction devices to suck the compost tea into the water and we irrigated. By the second week of August, every plant had new growth on it, it was back in full bloom, even though it was hotter and drier because the media they grow in, the pine bark, is terrible for growing plants. The reason bark doesn't rot on a tree, it's got chemicals in it to kill microbes. Plus it's a 500 to 1 carbon nitrogen ratio. So, but to give you an example, here's two cuttings. The only, this is like one week, two weeks, three weeks. The only difference, they put a few drops of a good compost tea in this one. We'll get a close up. Look at the difference in the root density. So what do you think if you're using a compost tea as a foliar drench around your plants, your roses, or house plants, 
eat them. You can make them stronger, healthier, grow faster. So, okay, on the processing, like I already mentioned, remove all your air hoses before turning off the aerators. The other thing, a common pitfall, people put too much, oh, if an ounce of molasses is good, maybe I ought to put a whole pint in. <coughs> you got so many bacteria that used all the oxygen, goes anaerobic, you ruin the tape. So you gotta be careful. Also, the other problem, you put too much certain like molasses, also it'll start foaming. The next thing you know, that five gallons has turned into 5,000 gallons of foam and making a mess. And like I said, cleaning up all, all the surfaces. So let's talk about production for a minute. <clears throat> There's two basic technologies. For most homeowners, we call what brewer. And that's a device where you put the compost, the air, the water, circulate, back to A brewer only gets maybe 5, 10% of the microbes in the compost off the compost. Then we use food resources to grow them. But it has a short shelf life, and we've got to do small batches. An extractor is a more expensive machine. It gets 30, 40% of the microbes off the compost. It can do a couple thousand gallons an hour. And the extraction process makes the microbes go to sleep, go dormant. So it has a seven to two week, seven day to two week shelf life. So depending on what you're doing on the extractor, then you apply things at application to wake all the microbes up. Doesn't have quite the high level of beneficial microbes as a brewer, but it's cheaper quick. So, anybody from here from the company in Houston called Souls Alive? Oh, they've done, you know, the George Bush Presidential Library, they did tea there, they've got, well, like a lot of the uh, stormwater retention ponds, you have, usually have them reeled out, eroded, they work, they spray that with compost tea, and for a month or two the grass grows in and fills it and stops the erosion. They're doing work for the highway department when they you know, do a new road to help get the vegetation established. They use extractors because they're, you know, they're applying thousands of gallons a day. So they have to have an extractor. But there's a brewer, there's a fancy one, that's about a 300 gallon unit. <clears throat> there's a 55 gallon. All kinds of shapes and sizes, real fancy ones. That's the worm gold, makes an excellent tea, but it's an $8,000 brewer, makes 400 gallons at a time. Uh, these are 200 $300 brewers. And here's a homemade design based on a bucket. You can build that for about $65, $70. Makes a decent tea. So there's all kind of flavors. <coughs> a number of years ago, I was up at Oregon State University and visited Dr. Elaine Ingham. She's one of the leading world experts on compost tea. Went to her lab. And here's one they built on a 250-gallon tote. They cost them about $300 to make a brewer. The pump is $200, the air pump. The rest is just the PVC and tubing and stuff to go with it. So there's not a yes, no, there's a lot of ways. There's a bigger, that's an extractor. And it goes in here, and it goes to the outside, it's got a 2,000 gallon tank, this is a 500 gallon. So, or, oh, about 12, 13 years ago, the city of Austin brought Dr. Elaine Ingham in for a series of lectures on soil biology and compost tea. It was a three-day lecture series, and during that time, she invited all the compost tea brewers. There were about 15, 16 companies at the time to come in, use my compost as a starting point, so everybody had the same starting point. Then the following day, she evaluated all the teas. A brand called the Worm Gold, which was you know, a big $8,000 machine, had the highest quality tea. The second highest quality tea was a homemade job based on a five gallon bucket by a guy named Bruce Dooley over in the San Antonio area. You can build this for parts for about 40, 50 bucks. Again, your air pumps and stuff. And for the backyard, five gallons to concentrate, that would cover you know, two average size lots. So, so anyway, and cost about 10 years ago, there's a lot of interest. A bunch of my master gardener customers, can you make them? So we bought materials, we made up 200 of them. 
and sold them to our customers up in the Woodlands area. But basically, you get something to hold the tea, you to hold the compost, you have an aeration stone that goes in it, the aeration creates circulation as air bubbling, knocking the microbes off. Then you have a second aerator that goes in the bottom of the bucket that creates circulation in the bucket. And the constant aeration of both of them gives you your oxygen. So it's a real simple design and it makes a good tea. Okay. So other things. Why did compost tea fail in some of the studies, some of the research work? Well, well one of the things, you know, compost is fibrous. If you don't screen your tea, and you have little pieces of, of the humus particles, it can clog up a sprayer. And so you're not getting the tea getting on the plant. And believe me, how many people with PhD can figure out they got a clogged sprayer? It's amazing. Where did they buy their PhD at? What, five or ten? Believe me, in, in reading about the research, I've seen more dumb stuff than I can believe. Well, the other thing we learned, if you remember your high school physics, sunlight. If we have a small drop, and ultraviolet hits it or sunlight hits it, what happens to it? It goes through it. Why do we use ultraviolet light in our sewer treatment plants? Because it kills microbes. Well, if you've got a small drop, now if we're applying a fungicide or a pesticide, we'd like the smallest drop possible to get the most even coverage, right? But if we use a small drop for compost tea, it allows the sunlight to go into the drop, killing all your microbes. If you change your orifice and your droplet size to a big drop, now the sunlight hits and refracts off of it, never enters the drop, doesn't kill the microbes. Physics 101. Would you spray at night? We're getting there. You're, you're catching on. Other thing we require, commercial sprayers when we're spraying chemicals, what do we try to do? Apply it fast, we jack the pressure up, right? High spray, we might have a tip velocity of the liquid coming out at 300 miles an hour. What happens to an insect hitting your windshield at just 50 miles an hour? Splat. Energy is related to velocity squared. So, if you do a convention like you spray chemicals, those microbes are hitting the least surface. You might as well be running into a wall of concrete. You're busting, you're killing all your microbes. You've got to use a soft, gentle spray. What kind of pressure are you talking about? <clears throat> it depends on the sprayer, but very gentle. Just enough to give a very gentle spray. Five pounds, something like that? Yeah, five, ten pounds. I know my, we'll have a little one-gallon sprayer I use. I just pump it up once or twice and just, you know. So, other things. Say you're in a spacecraft and you've got air pressure and you're fine. All of a sudden, you're in a vacuum of space. What happens to you? You explode. Or, say you've been skin diving and all of a sudden you come up too fast. What happens? Nitrosis. You, you get you blow up. Gee, so you have this spare you've pumped up to a couple hundred PSI or more, and all of a sudden you're out in the atmosphere back at 10, 15 PSI. What do you think happens to those microbes? They blow apart. So you just shot yourself in the foot. And as you were asking, earlier late in the day is the best time to apply it. You have less drying effects, less ultraviolet effects. The stomata are open so it can get into the, the leaf surface. So, like I said, we can use the juvets, fish emulsion, seaweed, different things. And of course, little magic thing called surfactants. So, yeah, a couple drops of dish soap in a gallon or a quart. Or they use yucca extract, wetting agents. 
same thing we do when we're applying a fungicide or a pesticide. It makes it work better. So, tips. Again, morning and evening, cool, moist conditions work best. Same temperature so we don't get the shock. Filtered water. Some of the success stories here in town. You know that, have anybody seen the pocket curry over here at MD Anderson? That was all done using compost tea to get the microbes in the soil so that you grow those. We learned that certain species of our wildflowers, grasses, will not grow if you don't have certain species of microbe in the soil. There's a very tight coupling linked. Houston Zoo, Bill Wyatt, and I'll show some slides in a minute. Antique Rose Emporium. Anybody been to Shangri-La Botanical Gardens in Orange? All their disease control, they're 100% organic, use compost tea. We use it in our nature center, sustainable growth, does that highway work I was telling you about. Plants for All Season Nursery is a big brewer. They sell it to their customers and they use it in the nursery. And like I said, the George Bush Library with all the native plantings was established using compost tea. Well, here's some work that Bill White is doing on the post oaks at Herman Park. Many of the post oaks have oak wilt disease. According to many of our ag universities, there is no cure for oak wilt disease. I'm sure you've all heard that. Well, Bill Wyatt talked to the, the parks people and allowed him to take one tree. You can see it was dying, dead limbs, poor foliage cover. He started doing both root drench and foliar spray on the tree. One year later, look how that tree had filled back out. All signs of the post oak wilt is gone. The tree is regrowing limbs. The, the branch drop has quit. He just received a contract to do every tree in Herman Park. Because under conventional wisdom, we'd lost every post oak tree, which was hundreds of them. So, so other things. Where can you learn more? Uh, you can go to saltfoodweb.com. That's Dr. Lane Ingham's website. She has a free newsletter you can sign up on. She has lectures on soil biology, soil food web, lectures on compost tea. She's got a compost tea brewer's manual. And she produces a micro compost tea microscope manual. So you can actually look at the tea and see the little critters swimming around and stuff. <clears throat> so it's kind of cool. We have a lot of information on my website in compost tea <coughs> about just making compost. This is the best compost backyard composting book if you want to make your own. And this is the book Teaming with Microbes that every gardener needs to read. It's totally revolutionized how we grow plants. Then there's two books, Compost Tea Making and the Compost Tea Brewing Manual and Compost Microscope Manual. You can get order here if you want to learn more on how to do it yourself and get things. Uh, international organizations now. It's been so successful all over the world. There's all kinds of groups trying to learn more, trying to define these things, how to make it more effective and better. So, lots of places to go. Uh, we got a chapter on it, the book I co-authored, the Power Garrett, on organic management professionals. And we publish a free gardening newsletter. Well, probably a lot of y'all know Brenda Smith, the Lazy Gardener, used to be for the Chronicle. When they let her go a couple years ago, I hired her and she writes a newsletter for us. And it's free at our website. So, questions. I hit you with a lot. If you were going to take a great old big button and put some stuff in it, uh -huh. compost, what kind of stuff and how much would you put in that button? Well, the comp cheap bucket is a 55 gallon drum. Well, one way you can do it is just get a, like a four-inch PVC pipe to fit down in there. You can cut a piece of the pipe off, put a piece of window screen around it, some tape to hold it. You've got your container to hold your compost. You can drop a hose of an air stone from an aquarium in it to circulate it there. Then you have another, you can put a you know, bigger air pump or you know, two hoses off a big air pump and you can drop a hole down to an air stone that creates circulation in the bucket. Right, but the point is right here, you don't just put stuff in there and walk away. You put air down in there. Got to have lots of air. And that's probably the single biggest mistake people made. They put too much food resource 
then get it going to walk away. And during the night, the microbial populations got so high, they used up more oxygen than pumps were putting in when anaerobic. Then you've got to tell you it was bad for plants. So we've learned why they were failures now. If you avoid these pitfalls, we're getting, as people understand it, we're seeing more and more success rate all over the world. It, I mean, huge success stories. And at a fraction of the cost of using chemicals. You know, fighting nature will follow you. Fight nature with nature. So other questions? Good question, Max. Yes, ma'am. Should, um, when, if you're going to drench the soil, should it be done wet on wet or wet on dry? If you're too dry, the soil probably, if it has organic matter, will become hydrophobic. So it's best to pre-wet it a little bit. If it's already got some moisture, you don't need to. So just the same as applying a you know, water cycle fertilizer chemical. Questions? Boy, it's the quietest group I've had in a long time. Now, I know better now. Yes, ma'am. Is there a recipe in any of this? Those brewers manuals have different recipes for different problems. Okay. And you approve of all of them? You, you have said a lot of stuff that doesn't work. Yeah. Well, that's why, I mean, basically it's so simple to make it work. You really have to do stuff to screw it up. That's the nice part about it. And if you just follow some simple common sense things, you know, then it works. And it's just real easy as long as you start with a good compost, don't put too much food, brew it overnight, use it the next day, <coughs> clean your equipment. So do you have to use it within 24 hours? Usually 48, 48 hours. hours. You get your best results. Now, if you continue to aerate it, It'll still be okay, but your quality is starting to degrade. So it peaks out in that 24 to 48 hour, typically. And again, you, by changing your feed stock a little bit, changing your brewing conditions, your water, you, you know, control that. But that's beyond the scope of this talk. <coughs> so. Yes, sir. I had heard that chlorine will dissipate from the water in 15, 20 minutes. A little bit longer than that, yeah, they do it overnight for sure. But the chloramine does not, and the fluoride does not. So, yes? Could you describe what you consider low quality I don't quite understand that. Texas does not have layman gloves. We have a company here, Grounds Up Railroad Ties, here in Houston, sells it as compost type. That's compost, 25 bucks a yard. We've got another company that grinds up logs. They get carbon black, you know, it's a carcinogen, byproduct of the chemical industry. They put it on the material, dyes it black, and they call it compost. 30 bucks a yard. It's not compost. What if you make your own? That's fine. That's great. But how do you know if it's going to be low quality or high quality? Well, one, you can send it to the soil food web, WWs have it tested. Two, most experienced gardeners can go into the forest get back to the top bulge, pick up that brown crumbly stuff that has that rich earthy odor, that's compost. You'll know that yeah, it has a good smell, it feels good, I mean, yeah, when you hold it in your hand, it just, Baxter, you'll breathe it. Yeah, it tastes good. Yep, high fiber. So, there's also, if you want another way, there's a, the Woods End Research, laboratory has a home compost test kit you can take compost she has a little plastic container you put about an inch of compost in it you put a couple little markers in it they're kind of like remember litmus paper from chemistry they're kind of like that put the lid on it four hours later you can come read the color that's changed to if it's purple that eight means you have a very mature ready to go compost if it's kind of reddish it's immature and kill plants it's about 20 bucks a test. So there's ways out there. Also, you can look at price point. If, it, if you're buying a bag of compost, if it's not $10, $12 a bag, you're buying garbage. Just think of economics. Man, batch is laughing at me now. <laughs> Say you're buying $3 a bag. A retailer to stay in business has to have a 100% markup. He paid about 50 for that bag. There's probably 30 cents a bag transportation cost to get it from whoever made it to the retailer. You're down to $1.20. 
the manufacturer at the wholesale level has to make at least 30% profit gross margin or he will not stay in business. You're down to about 85, 90 cents per product. A good quality bag, label printing, your, your baggers, your labor is about 75 cents a bag. You're down to 10 cents worth of product. 40 pound bag is roughly a cubic foot. That means you're paying $2.70 per cubic yard for your product. Real value. What kind of quality do you think you're getting for under $3 a yard? <coughs> Economics means you're buying garbage, some kind of waste that somebody wanted to get rid of. Conversely, if you work backwards, if you're not paying $10, $12 a bag, you're getting a low quality product. Pure economics. So what about buying it in bulk? Again, that's a good question. Compost prices are tied very closely to landfill rates. A couple years ago, my daughter was living in Seattle. And they, she and her husband got a new house. Of course, got to call Dad, come on down. We got a 20 yard. I need your help. Went all over the Seattle area, finally found a place that had good compost, and I was talking to them. In the Seattle area, the dump rates at landfills are about $120 a ton. We're at $25 a ton in Texas. That meant the composter up there got a $10 a yard dump fee for taking grass and leaves. It takes about 10 yards of grass and leaves to make a yard of compost. So he had $100 of revenue before he ever sold a single cubic yard. Sold it for $40 a yard, so he had $140 gross revenue per yard. Cost him about $35 to make it, labor, machinery, fuel, etc. So he had $100 gross profit per yard sold. In Houston, to get clean grass and leaves, we have to take it for free. Or with the cost of we have to, the cost of taking the bags and stuff off of its bag. Still 10 to 1, make it. We sell it for 60. Only cost us 25 to 30 to make it. Our labor and fuel is a little cheaper than Seattle. You make 25 to 30 dollars a yard gross profit. Pay your building, your taxes, all your overhead out of So if you buy something at 30 dollars a yard, you're not buying compost. If you, to be real compost, Again, it has to be up to the $60 range or more, you're not getting real compost. Economics again. We get many people coming in <coughs> from the East Coast or West Coast, where again, where all the rates are over $100 a ton, many cities used to, to save landfill space is so scarce, you know, they use tax dollars to subsidize it, and they never saw the real cost. So lots of things go into the price. That kind of makes sense? Teeming with microbes. Teaming. And I've been informed, Baxter, I better should. I talk for hours, so. <laughs> All right, thank you.